Great. So welcome to everybody. Good morning. I'm Amy Remond Snyder, and I teach medieval history here at Brown. And since 2010, I've been teaching the same subject in the men's medium security facility in the Rhode Island State Prison System. I want to first thank the units at Brown that made this conference possible. First, its major sponsor, which is the John Nicholas Brown Center for the Public Humanities, and then the co-sponsors, the Center for the Study of Slavery and, Justice, and Social Justice, the Office of Institutional Diversity, Diver, Diversity and Inclusion, and the Royce Family Professorship in Teaching Excellence. And I also want to especially thank the two people who helped to turn the idea of this conference into a reality. And that is the director of the John Nicholas Brown Center, Susan Smulian. <laughs> and above all, the center's assistant director of programs, the tireless and inspired Marissa Brown. Marissa is hiding in the back there. So let me welcome you all to this conference, a conference which I believe will prove the truth of a saying which is widely attributed to the 19th century French writer Victor Hugo. He who opens a school door closes a prison. All the statistics support the truth of this statement. Access to college education behind bars makes prisons less violent and safer places. It makes ex-offenders more likely to get jobs and less likely to recidivate. According to some studies, recidivation rate drops from about 46% to 22% among people who have had access to college education behind bars. In this era of the crisis of mass incarceration in the United States, these statistics alone should be enough to convince the public of the importance of having college education behind bars. Such programs benefit people who are incarcerated and they benefit the public. However, what these statistics don't capture is something much more profound, and that is the transformational effect that having a liberal arts education can have on incarcerated people's sense of themselves, their worldview, and their potential as human beings. And these statistics also don't capture the transformative effect that teaching in prisons can have on teachers' own sense of themselves, their worldview, and their potential as human beings. College programs in prison thus matter enormously in ways that our speakers will tell us more about today. And the existence of the programs that they run, whether here in Rhode Island or elsewhere in this country, along with the existence of dozens of other such programs, college education programs behind bars, reveal that there is indeed, as the title of this conference suggests, a prison education movement in the United States. We at Brown are eager to learn from the speakers about ways that we could expand at Brown our own role in this vital form of education and in this vital educational movement. But that said, I think it's important to note that Brown is already engaged with higher education behind bars in three ways. First, since last year, there has been a Brown chapter of the P.D. Green program, a program that originated at Princeton, in which undergrads and grad students go into prisons as tutors and as TAs. And that program was brought to Brown by a really remarkable junior, um, Aida Downey, from whom you'll hear a little bit later today. Second, there are Brown faculty and grad students who have taught credit-bearing courses in the context of the Community College of Rhode Island's associate's degree program at the ACI, which is run by the equally remarkable Will Jackson, from whom we'll hear in the first panel. And finally, there are Brown faculty who teach non-credit college-level history classes under the aegis of the program that I run. And that is a program that is variously known as BELLS and also as the Brown History Education Prison Project. This semester, BELLS is taking the form of a course which I teach, which is called Locked Up, A Global History of Prison and Captivity. And I'm teaching this course simultaneously at Brown, well, not at the same moment, but in the same week, simultaneously at Brown and in the men's medium security facility. And I create dialogue between those classmates who are on the outside here at Brown and the classmates on the inside, that is, at the ACI. 
Last year, the Brown students in Locked Up contributed a fabulous exhibit to a show that just opened last night, and perhaps some of you actually went to the opening. And it's a show that I want to urge you all to go and see. The um, details about its location and timing are there on your, the back of your program. But what I want to say is that this exhibit is called States of Incarceration. And it's the first national traveling multimedia exhibition on the history and future of mass incarceration in the United States. It was developed by faculty and students at 20 universities all across the US, including Brown. And it was, um, they all worked together in the context of a national program called the Humanities Action Lab, which was funded in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Institute for Museum and Library Science. And the Brown's um, exhibit in this show was funded by um, the John Nicholas Brown Center for the Public Humanities and the Dean of the College, so I want to thank them for that support. So I urge you all to go and see this show. It's downtown in uh, URI's downtown campus. So I want to turn to our first panel and to introducing our first speaker. The panel's title is Teaching in the Prison, and it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ralph Orlack. He trained originally as a special education teacher, and then he began teaching full time in the Rhode Island State prison system in 1990. In 1999, he took up his present position as special education director slash principal at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. And there he sees all over it, all educational programming. So, Ralph. Thank you, Amy. I'd like to begin by extending greetings on behalf of the department from Director A.T. Wall. I'm very fortunate to be part of his team. He's been very supportive of education ever since I've been associated with the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, and I'm proud of the work we do collectively. I believe the title of this program is The Prison Education Movement. Does Brown have a role? Well, let's talk about the prison education movement. What is it? I think it's very diverse and varied throughout the nation. When I first assumed a leadership role, I visited the York Correctional Facility in Niantic, Connecticut. There, for a population of 900 inmates, they had more teachers, counselors, and correctional office and um, social workers than I had for approximately three times the population. This spring, as part of a Correctional Education Association leadership conference, I toured the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. There, they had approximately 6,000 inmates, 4,000 doing life. Um, all the inmates work, they're in the fields, the correctional officer is on horseback with a shotgun, very different from an island culture. They have one or two teachers where the inmates serve as tutors, a very different model from the Rhode Island culture. So the purpose of my talk is to have those of you in the audience emerge with an understanding of how is correctional education delivered in the state of Rhode Island. I'd like to begin by describing the inmate population. I did an analysis recently on um, August 30th, I believe. On that particular day, we had 2,438 sentenced inmates. The inmates self-report their education levels, and rather than break it down to the minutia, I'll give you an overview. 36% did not finish high school. 62% did finish high school, and 1% had their AA degree. So how do we service this population? It's almost like a property. I'm going to describe the overview of the department and the staffing, the foundation, which is our core basic program of adult basic ed and GED, and lastly, the house itself, which is our post-secondary programs. So let's talk about the org organization of the department. We have, I believe, six securities, high security, maximum security, medium, minimum, intake, and women's, all located in one square mile, and I oversee all of these programs. I answer to Director Wall. I'm assisted by a staff of three supervisory people. Um, Lee Allison, who is there minding the house, shall we say. Will Jackson, whom you'll hear from later. And my other um, key person, Roberta Rounds, who is our GED coordinator as well as the office manager. We deliver core services with a staff of eight special education teachers, four GED teachers, one English as a second language teacher, one carpentry instructor, which is a total of 14 teachers, 13 academic and one vocational. I have one school social worker, 
six paraprofessionals, two librarians, and the three individuals I mentioned at the outset of this overview for a staff of 25 delivering educational services to this population. Amy cited some, some statistics. Why education? Um, a Correctional Education Association study shows education participants enjoy a statistically significant lower reincarceration rate of 21% compared to 31% to non-participants. And as an aside, you can find a lot more information on the website, www.ceanational.org. That's the National Correctional Education Association um, group that I belong to. We did a study recently through our own at, um, planning and research unit, and our study in Rhode Island showed there was a 14% drop in recidivism with individuals who declared themselves of having some college. So how does our program work? The first thing we do is for the individuals in talking about the foundation, the core programs, is assessment. All the inmates that are enrolled in class undergo the Comprehensive Adult Student Assessment System, commonly known as the CASAS test. Um, the CASAS test is a diagnostic tool used to place inmates in the appropriate class, and it's used to plan instruction, and it's given to over 600 inmates annually. It assesses reading comprehension and math to include calculation skills and the ability to comprehend mathematical processes. Um, the results are reported by education functioning levels, and trying to present a simple overview of educational functioning levels, um, there's beginning literacy, beginning basic skills, intermediate basic skills, advanced basic skills, adult secondary, and advanced adult secondary. Starting at the beginning, they equate to approximately two grade levels per, per level. Um, how we do things in the department is those who test below advanced basic skills, which equates to a sixth grade level, are put in our adult basic education classes. Those above that are put in our GED class. And again, that's more um, driven by the demographics than the scores itself, because if I went by some of the standards used in our community, everybody might be in an ABE class and nobody in a GED class. So the results um, work for the divisions that we've made. So again, I, know, I mentioned we have the adult basic ed class, the GED class, English as a second language, we offer it in medium security we, where we have our largest need-based group. As part of our adult education program, we also provide special ed services. Our special ed services are funded by the Individual with Disabilities Act and Title I. Um, we interview the inmates upon their interest in school who are 21 years of age or younger, find out did they ever have special ed services. If so, we contact the sending school, receive school records, we conduct an assessment, we do an IEP, meaning Individual Education Program meeting, just as they would have in a school system, and set up a program. Most recently, we were contacted by the principal of Coventry High School about a young man who was very close to his diploma. Long story short, we came to for, together for a joint IEP, we developed a program for this young man, and I believe in the next week or two, we will be able to award him his diploma. I can't do this systemically because it's not the Department of Corrections that awards a diploma, it's the school system. And I'm always willing to work with a school system when there's an inmate who is close to finishing high school. Um, as part of your, your entrance packet, you receive some information um, I what I call my annual report. I've really attempted to um, provide a one-page overview and the first thing I did was describe our partners in the annual report. Um, the Community College of Rhode Island, it was on, your t on the table when you came in. So if you didn't pick one up on the way in, do pick one up on the break. That we didn't have, sorry, we just had this. Okay, you didn't have this? No. Uh, Amy, I can, I'm immersed, excuse me, I can give yeah. you a copy and you can make them maybe before folks leave? Sure, yes. Okay, well I'll describe it in greater detail then <laughs> since I'm really running ahead of schedule. The first thing I did in my report was um, list our partners. I'm not going to talk much about the Community College of Rhode Island. I'm going to leave that to Will Jackson. I'm not going to talk much about College Unbound because James Montero will be presenting. I will say, though, I work very closely with Willie and James. I like to think of us as an extended family, with Will being the big brother having been around a half dozen years and James being the newcomer, the newborn, just starting out. 
We work closely so that the services of the two providers complement but don't compete with each other. And I say tongue in cheek, when I run out of inmates, that's when I'll say I don't need any more programs. We're far from that and we have large waiting lists. Amy described the Brown University Bells program, so that needs no further introduction. Roger Williams University approached us this spring and said, how can we help with the prison education movement? Well, we had several meetings and the conclusion we came to was we had an unmet need in the Department of Corrections. Our work release participants did not receive earned time because work release isn't considered a program, it's where they earn money for their work. Hence, there wasn't that much interest in the work release program um, area. So what we did was we said, okay, how can we create a program with work release to give them good time in addition to their salary? We were working on developing a curriculum. We call it the career readiness curriculum. We shared it with Roger Williams. They said, yes, they can deliver this. They created a program called Pivot the Hustle, which was a series of career readiness activities. They held their first graduation this spring. We're starting our second year and we're looking forward to the growth of this program. And lastly, there's the PD Green program. Um, we started this last year. I met with my teachers and um, Eleanor Roberts, who's the coordinator. I believe we had, and I'll read the statistics, seven teachers in four facilities volunteer and work with 18 Brown University students. It was wonderful. I believe all the teachers, save one, are willing to participate this year and I'm looking forward and I'm pleased that these teachers participated because there's nothing in it for them other than trying to do the right thing. And I'm pleased that um, these people will be participating. I'll share some of the statistical highlights. 116 inmates got their GED. We had in eight inmates get their um, AA last year. 742 education participants and 240, 206 vocational enrollments. 273 CCRI enrollments. Um, we tracked our special ed services to 116 inmates and over 300 youthful offenders for Title I. And I said there were 22 inmates in Pivot the Hustle. And again, I'm going to ask Marissa to make a copy of this um, for you. As I prepare to wind down, I'm going to share some correspondence I received from the inmate population itself. One of my teachers asked her class, why do you go to class? Here are some comments. I am very thankful for the GED system for giving young people and adults the opportunity to get their education. If you don't have our high school diploma, don't give up. Go get your GED. It is a great way to finish school if you didn't graduate. You have another chance to be someone you always wanted to be. That's from our GED students. I want to share one letter from an adult basic ed student which I found moving on a personal level. Dear Mr. Rolick, I am writing this letter to tell you about my teacher. She was the only one in 50 years that really helped me to learn how to read. She spent time explaining and going over the week, the work in class. It's not just me that needed it, but most of the students need the one-on-one. -on -one. In my years of school, I did not get enough one-on-one -on -one practice. She is a good teacher and I hope she stays working here forever. This man chased me down to tell me how good she was as she was a long-term substitute teacher and um, I'm pleased that she was awarded the position. <coughs> the last letter I'm going to share with you is about our next speaker. And this letter was read by Director Wall at every recognition ceremony we held a year ago. I'm sure you must get a ton of letters complaining about something or begging for something. This letter does none of that. This letter is a wish for you, uh, is, is a wish for you to praise a man whom I believe is an unsung hero. I am an inmate in the John J. Moran building. I will be receiving my associate's degree from CCRI by way of the graduation ceremonies held here in June 2014. Sir, I have been in and out of this system for 35 years. Self-worth has been troubling to say the least. Three and a half years ago, a man said to me to try something, to go for a degree using the Sunshine Program. He believed I could do it and more importantly, he believed in me. His belief in me has led to next month with a degree, but also Dean's List, go figure. This man works tirelessly towards helping not only me, but thousands of others to make something of themselves. In a normal week, you'll see him here at 8.30 in the morning giving GED tests, as well as 6 o'clock p.m. that very night introducing a college course and making sure all goes well. Every Friday afternoon, he is here for questions and concerns and always open to what you have to say. He does this in this building and how many others? Wow, 
He works crazy hours with little thanks and all in an effort to help change our lives. There is no doubt that the man is an unsung hero. There is no doubt he helped me believe in the future. That very future can be good in spite of the past. He has given me the ability to choose a better way. That man is Will Jackson, a man who deserves to be recognized for all of his hard work and devotion to a job I do, I do not believe any other would or could ever put this kind of effort into. I'm really pleased to work with Will. Last night, Hanley Ramirez hit a home run for the Red Sox and really shone big. Will Jackson hits home runs for me every day, so I'm going to turn the podium over to Will Jackson. Will? so very lucky when Will moved here um, about a decade ago after holding positions in higher education administration and advising <coughs> at the University of Southern Maine and at the University of Washington in Seattle. Since 2004, he's been the college program coordinator for the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, <coughs> and he oversees all college-level vocational credit programs for the facilities. And in particular, and as you've already heard, he runs the CCRI Associate's Degree Program at the ACI, which has over 1,000 enrollments per year and has awarded about 60 Associate's Degree to incarcerated men and women. So, now go. Gee, who says I don't get thanks? <laughs> Just got lots of it. Um, It's a long way from uh, advising business administration majors at the University of Washington in Seattle to the uh, Department of Corrections in Cranston. Cranston's much more interesting. But um, I've been reading a little bit lately about the history of prison education and the role of higher education in prisons. And it seems as though it's kind of like one of these graphs, the public sentiment and the political will to fund education and be interested in what happens to inmates sort of goes up and down. A couple of decades ago, um, it was a lock em up philosophy more than anything. And then uh, Attica happened. To an extent, that was a catalyst for people realizing, hey, we need to be doing more or doing something with <coughs> inmates besides locking them up. And um, the current trend of thought is almost undoubtedly that prison education is a good thing. Uh, President Obama has weighed in vigorously in the last few years on sentencing reform in prison education. He sort of set a tone for this, really. And of course, all the statistics bear out that, uh, you know, things that Amy and, uh, has said, we find that for every dollar invested in any kind of education in the prisons, ultimately saves taxpayers four or five dollars in reincarceration costs. So that's an enormous savings and hopefully has a bipartisan appeal as well. Um, add to that the lower recidivism rates, which has been mentioned for participants of any kind of prison education, and those recidivism rates are lower still for those who participate in higher education. And reducing population is a plus because we are the largest incarcerating modern country. I forget what the statistic is, but it's uh, outrageous how many people are incarcerated here. And we have a mandate in Rhode Island to reduce the prison population. And so one of the things that they did to reduce the population was they um, set up a good time program, meritorious good time, time off their sentence. X number of days for participating in education, X number of days for doing a college course. And it starts to add up, taking years off their sentences in some case. And that's the idea, is to reduce the population as well as educate. So that's a plus. And then there's, um, I wrote here anecdotal evidence, although I think it's more than that, of better behaved inmates, which is a large concern for obviously the correctional officers and the wardens, is that if you have an inmate who's involved in a meaningful pursuit, like education or higher education, and they're less involved in staying the same person that they were when they came in, then you've got an environment that's more conducive to the way it needs to run, which is security, custody, and control, which is the big issue for the correctional officers. Well, it seems that education is keeping the inmates at least satisfied in some way and less 
restless, less likely to act out. Um, I'm going to give out another statistic here that I just read the other day, which was sort of astonishing to me. In San Quentin, the famous prison in California, there's a prison university project known as PUP, which uses Berkeley, Stanford, and University of San Francisco professors. And in California, about 65% of released prisoners return to prison within three years. We've heard statistics like that before. That's pretty high. But the recidivism rate for PUP participants at San Quentin was 17% after three years out. And none of those returned for a violent crime. That says something really large to me. On the other hand, quality higher ed prison programs like PUP and uh, Temple University's uh, Inside Out program, Bard College, who are here today, Cornell and Princeton, they are uh, hard to replicate, and there are a few of them in the country right now. Even though the, the will may be there, the question is the resources, lack of money, as well as political will. Um, a little bit of history, it used to be in 1990, up to 1994, the Pell Grant, which most of you know what that is, it's the, it's the largest source of federal grant money for any student going to any college. It's the premier higher education grant, Pell Grant, named for Claiborne Pell from Rhode Island. Uh, in 1994, it was banned in the prisons. Up until that time, I'm not sure how they administrated it or administered it, but prisoners could get Pell Grant, which certainly paid for college education uh, in terms of, of funds. But in 1994, they just did away with it. So it's been interesting to look since 1994 to see how higher education programs have been funded in prisons from 1994 to now. And resources have always been the main issue. So creative fundraising of some sort uh, is, is, is imperative to being able to run higher education programs. When I came on board at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections in 2004, there was kind of a patchwork approach to higher education. There would be a CCRI course here, maybe New England Tech would weigh in with something, but there was nothing comprehensive. And then in that year, uh, resources were pooled from general revenue, adult basic ed funds, Perkins grants, and a few other sources like that to support a budget that resulted in RFP for vendors to apply to DOC to run post-secondary programs. Uh, CCRI was awarded that contract, and to my way of thinking, it was a natural choice because low-cost tuition, a variety of different kinds of programs, folk tech and credit, and uh, spread throughout the state. Rhode Island's small enough so that, as you, Ralph alluded to, we have one state prison, and that's it in Cranston with six different facilities, and we have one community college, the Community College of Rhode Island with five different campuses, or six if you count Cranston, which I do. Um, so my task as the college coordinator was to determine which programs and courses from CCRI's considerable menu would be appropriate to run in the prison and in which facilities should they go. And uh, this was out on the table. I hope maybe you picked it up. It's the overview, sort of a fact sheet of what fall 2016 looks like underway right now at the prison. And you'll see that the top half of the sheet is credit courses and the bottom is certificate vocational technical courses. So um, what we determined, I worked with Ralph, I worked with wardens, I worked with A.T. Wall himself, and we determined that men's minimum should get most of the vocational programs, the skills like construction, culinary, plastering, the things that are on this sheet, because the men's minimum inmates are closest to the street in a general way. And so that's what I did. I put most of those, as you can see from the sheet, in minimums and also in women's, which is kind of a mixed bag of people with, with varying length of sentences. And then I put credit courses in the facilities where people were residing for a longer time, maximum, medium, maximum men's, medium men's, and the women. Again, there were longer termers there. And in fact, what I ended up doing really was, I've, in the last few years, I've put a lot of energy into my higher education credit program. 
CCRI, being a community college, can go as high as associate's degrees, and that's all. And from then on, they can pursue a bachelor's, which is something other people will talk about here. But since I've been there, we've awarded 66 associate's degrees, many of them high honors, and uh, we have about, as Amy alluded to, 1,000 enrollments per year, which is not 1,000 students. That would be great, that would be one out of every three inmates would be in education, but no, it's 1,000 CCRI enrollments, meaning like registrations. So you'll have a student that takes three or four of the same classes, or uh, different classes. Okay, so, um, and then the credit program in Medium has 250 students pursuing their AAs. They take one course per semester, and if they're doing five or 10 years, it adds up to an associate's degree. And that's why we've been able to give out 66 associate's degrees. Then about five years ago, I appealed to Doris Buffett, who's a pretty well-known philanthropist. She runs the Fu uh, Sunshine Foundation. At, which funds a number of different educational courses, some of them in prisons. And uh, I asked her for money, and she agreed to fund a pilot program in Department of Corrections Medium where we would accelerate the pace for getting the AA. And she paid for them to take two classes per semester instead of one, get there in about three years. And so we've been through one set of students. They admitted four years ago. They got their AAs in three years, and then a new group uh, entered in. In fact, she increased our funding the, for the next group, which was nice. And um, she wanted us to implement other uh, aspects of, of, the, of the academics of the situation. For example, she, she insisted that we do sort of a cohort theory, which is you know where they live together, study together, or at least associate and kind of move together as a group. A little hard to do in the prison. We started it out with one of the so-called blocks, which are like dormitories in medium with all the sunshine program students in one building. Uh, but then that was a little hard to manage. But nevertheless, it is sort of a cohort because there they are residing in the same place, taking classes together, studying together, and they all know each other pretty well. And it moves, moves them along that way. Um, other aspects of college and college life are not possible in a prison. Um, what we do in CCRI at the DOC is we replicate the programs that are on campus. So, you know, we've got our catalog. And in our catalog are 20 or 30 academic programs and a whole lot of vocational technical programs. And admission requirements for admitting, course content, grading, all of it is the same as on campus. So it's not a watered down version in any way. Uh, we do the testing, reading, writing, and math skills, and we <coughs> offer as much student support and advising as possible, done by me. Uh, but some things are clearly missing. Um, we don't have internet. The instructors can bring in PowerPoint, so thankfully they can do that much. No internet capabilities, no real research capabilities. There's a library there, but it's not the kind of thing that a student on a college campus would have. So there are some aspects that are kind of missing that the instructor has to be able to fill in to a certain extent. It's almost like back to the little red schoolhouse. You're gonna go in, you'll maybe have your PowerPoint, you'll have the chalkboard and the textbook, and that's the way the course is gonna be run. Um, uh, along those lines, uh, the instructors are all hired from CCRI. They're uh, adjunct faculty or full faculty. I've myself uh, brought a few new people on board, quite a few new people, and they get approved by the appropriate department. Um, Amy and uh, Matt Harrison, another Brown professor, has uh, introduced me to a number of Brown instructors who wanted to teach at the prison, and so they have done a great job. So people that come forward to teach are people that are looking for this kind of challenge and a teaching experience. And almost to the last person, they leave the classroom at the end of the semester and say, that was one of the best classes I've ever had. And other quotes like, he was the most brilliant student I've ever had in a college class. And this is from someone who's taught for 20 years at CCRI and other places. So that's 
heartening and also really good for the instructor. It's a, a win-win experience for both. Um, and the other thing about restrictions, actually I had a little uh, anecdote I wanted to tell. PowerPoint, okay, has to be approved by the warden to enter with PowerPoint. My anatomy instructor gave me a list of things she wanted to bring in this semester, which included a cow's heart and a box of bones. They were vetoed. She could bring in plastic bone replicas and that was all. Um, okay, how am I doing for time? Okay, perfect. Um, I think that's it, but I'm going to go back to that PUP program at San Quentin. Uh, so, oh, I, I was going to sort of uh, conclude with my sunshine uh, idea was creative funding, different ways of finding funds to put these uh, courses in place is a big, big thing. And back to PUP, the organizer, the executive director of the prison program in San Quentin, Jody Lewin, says about expanding higher ed in other prisons, quote, it's incredibly labor intensive and requires an enormous amount of diplomacy. It's like welding underwater. Everything is slower, which is true to a certain extent. The prison is not meant to be a dynamic place welcoming new opportunities. Uh, we push them to do it uh, and, and, and somewhat begrudgingly do some of them put the classes in place. Um, you might understand that ideologically there are members of the administration that are not supportive of education. Uh, but because of the things I talked about before, behavior of inmates, what they see going on in the classrooms, the quality of the teachers that come in, you know, we're not fooling around when we put these higher education classes in the prison. And the COs and the wardens see that, and they, they see the benefit of it too. So in the end, it, it is a winning situation. Thank you. Rob Scott, who holds a PhD in education. And he has taught and written on the history, philosophy, and pedagogy of educational systems. He's the executive director of the Cornell Prison Education Program at Cornell University. And this program operates in three prisons and serves over 150 incarcerated <coughs> students. It's also a program that is active in creating coalitions for higher education in prison. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out this morning. Thanks to Marissa and Susan for the great organizing, the nourishing conversations we had last night. Um, <coughs> pleasure to be here and exciting to see Brown thinking about getting uh, more deeply involved in prison higher education. Um, I'm tr I've been thinking about this as the talk has been approaching and I'm trying to be a dynamic speaker by uh, learning very quickly where you guys are at with what's going on in the prison system here in Rhode Island. Um, and so we'll try to seed references into this. I was haunted by a comment made to me by a professor when I was young. He said, don't be an aboutnik. Uh, it's a play on the word of beatnik, you know what a beatnik is. Um, and so he said, go ahead and in engage and in indulge yourself in empirical research, but do something. Um, so I'm thinking about what um, might be done and that's the uh, direction I'm headed because we will have a conversation that's uh, more dynamic after this. Um, it sounds like Brown's got a great start from everything I've learned thus far. You've got faculty who've jumped into teaching in prison. You've got a DOC that's willing. You've got world-class undergraduate and graduate students. Um, we could talk about, and I could talk about how Cornell engages students around prison education. Um, and you're in the major metropolitan hub of your state. Big difference from the Cornell program. Um, in 15 years of us providing college courses in prisons, only five individuals have paroled to the county that Cornell is located in. 
So we have a very different dynamic than, say, Columbia, which is in New York City, where a lot of people parole out of the prison system in New York State. So, so that so that's also speaks to the boundary between being in prison and out of prison afterwards and the role universities can play there. Um, you probably have wonderful development opportunities around this as well, particularly at this political moment right now. We could talk about that a little bit. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna say one theoretical thing and then try to just give a bunch of really practical stuff. The theoretical thing is that, and this comes from engineering and systems theory, I always kind of want to say something conceptual, which is that a regulatory system will have more variety than the system that it regulates. We don't often think about that. If you want to keep the temperature between 68 degrees and 72 degrees, in the air in a building, you need a thermostat that can measure when it's outside of that range, right? and, then, and then trigger the right changes of state to bring the temperature back to the right range. Um, it's, okay, it's a metaphor. Uh, in the correctional context, uh, the regulated parties, um, typically the response, what happens? We always hear about in prison when someone acts outside of the rules or when something goes wrong. Um, and the general response and the theme we hear for decades on end then is uh, to try to reduce the variety of the regulated party. Um, the other way to respond to that is to expand the range of what the system is capable of doing. Um, typically this is received by places where there isn't college and prison as rewarding, good, uh, rewarding bad behavior, that's what they'll call it. And when we, if we ever get into a real debate about the Pell Grant and what's going on with um, denying people in prison college in this country, um, you'll hear that talking point come out. You're rewarding bad behavior. Um, the regulated party here did bad things, and then you're giving them some expanded range of things that they can do that they shouldn't get all this variety in their life. They should have it constrained more. Um, so the other way of talking about it then, and though it's a kind of a therapy word, is I would call it redirection. Um, so in a way, it's not so much to say, okay, when someone does something bad, let's give them rewards. Um, it's rather to look at the variety we add to the correctional system as creating other avenues and outlets for human behavior, um, not only bad avenues. Okay, so that's the spirit of all that I then say, which is on the more practical. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I've got even more theoretical stuff. I don't want to read all that right now. <sighs> I, I, so you've already worked within this community college framework. I mean, here's, this is one of the, here's, let's use that as a starting point. Um, does Brown have a role to play? Yes, probably it has a special role. In other words, Brown could add to the variety of the system. I mean, that, that, so that's the bridging connection here. Um, we work with a community college at Cornell University. Um, we partner with them in offering courses through their course book, but we also add courses of our own. So that's probably, um, and I've worked with a lot of colleges at, at getting to the point of thinking about this, that's the difficult question to ask is, is there a way that Brown courses could be offered, co for credit bearing Brown courses? How would you do admissions? What would happen around tuition? Um, how would the course be assessed? How would oversight work? Could there be research? Those are all very difficult questions, but I consider that to be the cherry on the cake, that you want to get there at some point. So it should really be thought of if you don't get there the first couple of years that one is operating in a correctional environment, fine, but do keep that on the radar. I think Cornell was in the prison system about five years before um, we figured out all of the mechanisms by which it would be possible to offer a credit-bearing Cornell University course, just a single course. Um, but that's a huge piece of cultural capital to, to tell someone, you've got a Cornell University student ID number and a transcript with courses on it. That's pretty much, that credit will stand up anywhere in the world. It'll transfer into the community college and it'll transfer into just about any other college. Um, but so, but that need not be the only variety that is added, uh, Brown courses. Uh, but I will say though, um, it will often come up if you engage more and more of the faculty uh, and whoever else is teaching from your university, that there are courses offered at universities that maybe aren't in the course catalogs of community colleges. And that's, so this is where it's, uh, it's, it's just uh, rigorous thought here, uh, it, explicitly, variety that doesn't exist in the system without your university. Um, graduation ceremonies are a place where you can add a lot of variety to the system. Um, why? Because these are symbolic ceremonial events in the lives of people who are incarcerated and they result in named changes in the lives of people that carry with them for the rest of their lives. Um, so there are the conferral of associate degrees. We participate in that. Um, there's also 
additional awards. You know, universities, we love giving each other awards all the time, right? <laughs> so you can do that in prison too. Um, in our case, we had um, a student in our courses in the early period who mentored some of the younger students. He's an older guy. Um, at some point he got cancer, and so he started dedicating all his life to mentoring these younger students. Um, and as he slowly expired, the group of students came up with the idea of naming an award after him. So the guy's name was Ricardo Callender. We now, every single time there's a graduation ceremony, we have the Ricardo Callender Award for Student Mentorship in the Cornell Prison Education Program. Um, the students are asked to nominate one of their peers as the mentor of the year. Uh, they're presented with a certificate, to, which is a sort of frameable item that they can carry with them for, to the extent they can have it in property. Okay, we can get into the differences between correctional systems, but they're given a, a, a real memento of this uh, achievement. Um, having been selected by their peers, they're allowed to give a speech at the event, um, the graduation ceremony. Um, and again, the corrections folks loves it. This, this, is what I'm, this is where we say more, it's more about redirection. So now you're actually creating an avenue for behavior. It's not, it's, it's not rewarding bad behavior, it's rewarding good behavior. That's so, okay, so this is to make my point again. Um, simply giving a speech at a graduation ceremony um, adds to the variety of what is talked about at a prison. So we bring in a guest speaker into Auburn Penitentiary and it gets talked about for five years what this person has said. Um, or showing a movie, I, many of us know this type of stuff. Um, simply adding a few brown faculty members to the academic procession, or if, if there is an academic procession. Sometimes our folks in corrections um, don't know all the pomp and circumstance that we do for a graduation. So they'll do a graduation ceremony in the guest room with cookies and a glass of water and no stuff. Um, we can bring the stuff that makes it an event um, that makes it important. We can tell them how important it is to bring family members to a graduation ceremony. Bring your kids. Um, one of our, uh, I remember our valedictorian a few years ago wasn't going to invite his kids to the graduation ceremony and we finally told this guy what was actually going to be at the graduation ceremony. The whole thing became about his kids because his kids were watching him graduate from college. Um, this became a, becomes a transformative uh, rite of passage for the family that your family has college graduates in it. Um, and Cornell University professors came and applauded you and gave speeches about you and awards were given out to people that did good things here. Um, little C certificates, I call them, the, where even if you do a class that's a non-credit history course or something like that, um, simply making some item that confers and tokens the moment in history that is uh, their completion of the course is important. Those will hang up in the, in the otherwise sparsely decorated cell of a prison house uh, for years to come. Um, okay, what else do we have here? Just, uh, just throwing out variety at you at this point. I mean, this is sort of a barrage. Um, advisement of students. It sounds like actually Will's got that pretty well covered. I don't think maybe Brown needs to do that. But adding then, uh, how about this, upper division courses or finding some opportunities for folks who've completed the associate degree. Certainly something that we at Cornell found um, goes beyond uh, what the community college offers by itself. Um, bringing graduate students and undergraduate students into the prisons um, is a rich area of conversation. I could say a lot about that. Um, I probably don't want to say too much, but I guess I'll just um, bookmark that. Uh, I crunched the numbers over the past eight years of the Cornell Prison Education Program. 60% of our credit-bearing courses were taught by advanced candidates in PhD programs would pass their exams and through following the same rules as we'd follow on campus were made instructors of record for a course, either a community college course um, or typically an introductory level course from campus. Um, you know, we typically get hung up on, oh, what are we, uh, how do graduate students get paid? Do we have enough money for this? We typically look for low cost situations here um, and that's usually the hang-up also on offering or one of the hang-ups on offering credit-bearing courses um, simply introducing the admissions process 
uh, you can add, add a lot of the uh, processes that happen at a university before you actually have permission to do credit-bearing courses. So we do blind review of candidates trying to get into our program. That in and of itself is transformative of prison culture. So, uh, well, it can be. I, I don't know Rhode Island. I don't always want to presume I know what prisons everywhere because I know the prisons in New York. Um, but folks who I've known in prison are familiar with favoritism, which is, I like this guy, but I don't like that guy, so this one's in my class, and that guy has to go into some housing unit that he doesn't really want to live in. Um, so when people um, ask to be um, given a job at their prison, when they ask to be in the college program, when they ask to do whatever, um, there's a huge skepticism about whether this is really about my merit and my worth as a person, and whether I filled out my application properly, etc., or whether it is about um, I, someone got told, you know, don't, don't work with this person, or some ticket I got written a few years ago hung me up, or maybe it's about racial prejudice, or maybe it's about all the other things that we know are shot through the way that prisons can often operate. Um, so blind review, simply as the director of the program, saying everyone write an essay, taking it back to Cornell, and erasing off the names on the PDF, distributing it to faculty, and saying, select who should be in this advanced writing workshop, and then telling the people at prison what that process is so they can hear that they actually really earned this opportunity from Cornell faculty. They were selected not as someone who was known to be a particular person, but on solely the merit of their work. Um, a rare opportunity, actually, for folks in prison. And, and I would say something that then is requested if once people realize, oh, you can do that? Could you do that with how we do this part? Could you do that with how we select TAs? Because that would be really nice. It was based on <laughs> our conduct, as opposed to who, who likes my personality or knows about the crime I did or something like that. Um, since you're in Providence, um, there's probably a whole set of networking functions that Brown could serve. Um, I, and I, I, so colleagues of mine could speak much better to the outside of prison wall um, work that can be done in people that continue to try to get to college after they've been released from prison. Um, but there's a whole set of advising, navigating financial aid, um, connecting with other institutions, even just making it to an, I mean, this is the type of thing that we see all the time. One of our guys gets out, he gets told, okay, you can, there's a service here that'll be provided to you. He takes the subway through New York City and shows up and realizes the form of ID he has is wrong. And so just the, the navigation of bureaucracy, um, there's a whole set of um, things that there's just, someone needs to dive in and start working on how to help folks um, fill out FAFSA. Um, they're eligible for Pell the day they get out of prison. <laughs> Um, and if there's other programs that are denied to folks in prison, like there are in New York, we have the tuition assistance program, eligible the day they're out. Um, but how do you actually start developing the bureaucratic navigation techniques? Um, and could the colleges that want to help people on the inside still want to help them on the outside? Um, and then you eventually get into the very controversial question of, are they allowed to come to campus and do things here? I'm going to punt on that one. Um, <laughs> Library, so, uh, so someone's already mentioned it. There's not um, great research opportunities for undergraduate students in prison. Um, that's part of the game if you go to Brown University, I'm sure, is you are gonna be doing research as an undergraduate. So um, we can help to bring a library probably to the prisons in our states um, by working with the DOC, asking what the regulations are about curated collections of resources for volunteer programs or however they wanna put it. Um, Professors are given advance copies and desk copies, and we know that lots of people are throwing away books, actually, because they don't really deal with them anymore. A lot of us are digital only at this stage. Um, there are great opportunities to collect those paper fossils and bring them into prisons and curate collections of books that can then serve the functions that demonstrate the potential for higher learning. Um, that, go that goes beyond the range of um, what what's already there. Um, Okay, and so then I, I'll wrap up this little part, but I think the, um, the thing I would emphasize is before you just say, oh, unless we offer brown courses, we're not gonna be able to add much. There's all this other stuff you can add, and what, what happened at Cornell, I've seen this, we did this in Illinois, where I had launched a program earlier, um, is you create this environment in which many of the accoutrements of how things operate at Brown are there, um, and that's when you bring in a dean or someone who um, might be able to push forward other conversations around things like offering a credit-bearing course, um, you bring them, in, bring them in to meet the students, um, see the library, talk about that blind review process, have it come out of the mouths of one of the students. 
um, have one of them describe what it meant when there was suddenly a mentorship award that Brown sponsored, probably at no cost, um, and inspire them. Ask, ask a dean to do a guest lecture at your prison. That's a great way to get things going. So we did that. We had the president of Cornell gave a talk at our prison in 2007. Um, that was gold, because that guy was out there talking about it. He wrote an article in Fortune magazine. Um, the development side was made aware that the president was interested in our program. Um, these things play great dividends. Um, and it was important that when he went there, the students were ready to say, when Cornell came to this prison, things changed. Before we had this, and that was what we had, now we also have Cornell, it's made a difference. It's expanded the range of what we think is possible. Here are some positive outcomes. And then they posed him with very difficult questions. Am I out of time? <coughs> I'm totally out of time. Then we are gonna leave the rest of the round table. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. So I want to introduce our last speaker for this panel, who is Jill Stockwell. She's a doctoral candidate at Princeton University in the Department of Comparative Literature. She specializes in Turkish and German literature. Since 2013, she has taught composition and literature courses inside the New Jersey State Prisons, and she is the co-founder of The Prison and the Academy, a lecture series at Princeton that looks at the role of higher education in the era of mass incarceration. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to come. Uh, thank you to Marissa for your amazing organization of all of us down to the very last detail. Um, sure. Everyone was so good at just speaking. I need visuals, so. Um, but yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting us here. And, Really, it's, it's, it's great for our program um, to have this as well. It's not, it's not just for Brown, though. I really hope that um, we have a fruitful conversation that's really directed at um, all your biggest questions, and that we can sort of make this a collaborative um, kickoff, though I know this conversation's been going on for a long time. But it's also great for us, I mean, just to be able to speak to other people. There's a lot of things that other people have figured out and gotten underway that we haven't, and it's just great to have this forum to sort of share. Um, like we ha at Princeton don't have credit, Princeton credit bearing courses. We teach through community colleges, um, which, which I'll speak to. Um, but things like that are gonna be very helpful for, for me to also bring back to my program. So thank you very much. Um, so this is just a brief introduction to uh, the Prison Teaching Initiative at Princeton of which I'm uh, a part, I'm the chair of the Humanities Committee. I think I'm having trouble making this move. <coughs> oh, I'll do, it my, I'll do it on here, the old fashioned way. Um, so uh, the way I put together the presentation is to just bring you basically through our model um, and then I hope that w you know, in the discussion section I'll also have some time to talk about sort of our hopes for where we're going to take the program because it really is sort of a work in progress um, and also sort of what we see the strengths of, of the current model and what we see as things that we'd really love to improve. Um, so I'll just walk through our, our sort of basic statistics, who we are, um, how we got there, our institutional history, how we do it, sort of who our partners are and who our accreditors are. Um, then through our organizational model administration, I'll talk about money, I'll talk about funding a little bit, how we're, how we're um, able to sort of piecemeal, um, put it together on a daily basis, and then talk about sort of four principles that guide our continuing evolution as a program. Um, so first and foremost, we're, we're volunteer. We're all um, unpaid um, faculty. We do consider ourselves to be a separate faculty within the Princeton campus. Um, we refer to each other as faculty, whether you're a postdoc, whether you're a faculty, a Princeton faculty member, whether you're a graduate student. We sort of have this non-hierarchical model in which we, we, we teach all together collaboratively. Um, our mission is pretty simple. I think it's also maybe a little dated given sort of the updates to the thinking on um, the, the many different values of prison education beyond decreasing recidivism, but as it stands, our 
mission is to reduce incar incarceration rates by increasing the access to post-secondary education. And, and that's the reason that we've kept, well, among other reasons, but that's one of the reasons why we're volunteer faculty. We sort of try to teach above and beyond the limits of funding in, in New Jersey that are available for um, inside higher education. Um, and we're comprised of a group of, whoop, there goes my name tag, a group of, uh, about every semester we have about 75 to 100 uh, people who are actually teaching. And again, this is people from all over the university. Um, we do have some staff, basically, um, similar to what Rob was saying, um, you just have to be a post-master's student. So we have lots of people in the joint degree program who are teaching. We also have staff. We have um, librarians and administrators who are, who are um, long-term teachers with PTI. And it ends up being a really, um, a really unique space on campus for that reason as well, insofar as we all interact as um, educators. Um, so the basic thing that we do is we teach core English and math sequences um, in New Jersey state prisons. Um, and that uh, basically means that we start with the preparatory classes. Our students take an AccuPlacer exam. When they're admitted to the college program, it's open admission. Anyone can do it. There's a wait list, but there's no sort of test to get in. There's a test after you get in, and then you're placed into either a preparatory class or you start with the, the sort of 101, the credit bearing courses. And we teach from preparatory all the way to advanced. Um, I'd say we teach about three courses um, in each of the core English and the math sequences each semester. And the rest um, can be really in anything. This is a sort of a smattering of everything that I think we've taught in the last two years. But it encompasses literature, philosophy, astronomy, biology, ecology, sociology, psychology religion, Arabic, and Latin. This semester, we also added um, an Italian class, which our students had been sort of hammering for. Um, and we also added um, a history course. Um, our teaching model is primarily teams. Um, we have some individuals, particularly Princeton faculty, will decide, oh, I want to teach a creative writing class or something. And then they'll just teach a full class themselves. Um, but for the most part, we teach in these two different models of teams. Uh, the pod is what math and science does, where you basically have one teacher of record. And then you have other people who teach in units. So they, that teacher of record or pod leader, um, who's normally a faculty member, um, will coordinate a team. And then other people come in and teach one or two units of like introductory math or uh, science. The, on the humanities and social science team, um, it's much more this sort of traditional model where, you know, say I with one to, to three other people teach on a rotating basis. We come in together for the first class, we come into the last class together, and we come in for things like, um, we call them editor's meeting or, or con you know, conferencing hours where you come in um, at strategic points throughout the semester to discuss student work um, with lots of individual one-on-one -on -one meetings. And other than that, we sort of rotate through. Um, briefly, this is our institutional history. Um, we were founded by a postdoc at Princeton named Mark Krumholtz. Um, he came through PUP, um, which has already been mentioned several times today, and which some of you may have heard this week received the uh, President's uh, Humanities Medal, which is hugely exciting to see the good guys get the money. <laughs> um, this was alongside professors who are still important faculty members for us, um, Jill Knapp and Jenny Green, uh, also um, uh, in the Department of Astrophysics. Uh, Jill Knapp is probably our most uh, favorite a graduation speaker, most frequently requested, because I think there's a galaxy named after her. So it's fun to read her bio. Um, in 2006, we, so in, in 05, we, we started um, it was just sort of like an idea at that point, and they really began teaching um, courses for this certificate program in 2006. It was a business certificate program through Mercer County Community College, and basically we were hired um, as adjuncts, um, sort of uh, without pay, but you know, submitting materials and, and whatnot. So we were on record at, at the community college. Um, in 08, this expanded to include the composition series. Um, 
Then in 2013, we were a founding member of uh, New Jersey STEP, that's Scholarship and Transformative Education in Prisons. Um, I'll say another word about them in a moment when I talk about our different partnerships in the state. But basically, that was the, the point at which we were able to begin offering um, associate's degree courses or courses that led towards the associate's degree. Um, and, and we have a sort of another turning point this year, which is that we've partnered with Rutgers University and now are now offering um, BA courses. So again, it's important to note that Princeton's name is not on either a degree or um, any classes, that we are all folks from Princeton, but we are technically adjuncts of other universities. And that's how we've been able to make it work. Um, so a word on, on these partnerships um, that allow us to teach these credit-bearing courses. So NJ STEP is a consortium, I think it's currently of nine institutions of higher education in the state of New Jersey. Um, they receive money from, uh, and those are both two-year community colleges as well as four-year institutions like Princeton and Rutgers. Um, and basically, and, and NJ Step receives funding. I don't know who they're going to receive funding through next. They just finished a four-year pilot program, so we're sort of all on the edge of our seats. Um, they had been receiving money um, through the Ford Foundation by way of the the Bear Institute, um, the Pathways Project, as well as the Sunshine Lady, as well as the Soros Foundation, as well as. There's sort of a list of five or six um, funders on their, on their website, but I, I'm not sure how up to date that really is. Um, again, it was a four-year pilot program that's still continuing into a fifth year now. Um, so we're all just sort of looking to see what will, what will happen next. Um, STEP hires uh, inside um, academic faculty. They hire academic counselors. So when a student is absent, we don't have a way of accessing them outside of our class time. So we'll contact that step counselor and say, could you help us figure out what happened to this student? Were they not released? Was the whole tier not released? The same student has been absent for three weeks. Is there an issue with, a, with an officer or whatever? Um, and they're also the ones who help students figure out what they need to be enrolling with to get to their degree um, in the most efficient way. Um, so uh, our other accreditation partners, for, for 10 years we worked with Mercer. Um, now, the, and that was what, at a point when STEP was working with a whole consortium of schools that were each accrediting degrees. So there could be a Mercer graduation at one facility where Mercer was mostly teaching. There could be a Raritan graduation in another facility where Raritan was mostly teaching. Um, this could work even with people from other community colleges teaching in those facilities because there's a, it's called the New Jersey Transfer Program where basically um, the community college courses are supposed to be able to transfer directly. Like if I come from, from one community college, I could transfer to another and every course should be able to be accredited. Um, that in practice ended up being too complicated a system and didn't wasn't sort of well ironed enough for STEP to continue working with them and they now only work with Raritan Valley Community College. So last year we've switched to crediting partners and are working with them and we're also now working with Rutgers University. Um, the, the community colleges are open enrollment so anyone, you know, there's not an admission process, everybody can just start. Um, but again, this sort of relies on this system of an acuplacer exam at the beginning of the process and then probably some preparatory work for a lot of people before they can get to the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and now we also work through with Rutgers University and STEP is actually housed in um, the Rutgers Newark campus. That's where they sort of operate out of. Um, so our organizational model, we are this 12-person um, committee. We're half math science and half um, humanities and social science. And this basically has to do with just the way we run these courses, that the sort of pod model people are on one side and the team model people are on the other. Um, but we coordinate with carpooling and training and recruitment and things like that. Um, and we meet together uh, mostly on a weekly basis. And again, we're so I'm the chair of the humanity side, and Jenny Green, um, who's a faculty member of astrophysics, is the chair of the math science. So we're not exactly counterparts, but 
um, for the purposes of PTI, we are. That, you know, I work really closely with Jenny. I get 7 a.m. calls from her. Um, we have a relationship that's probably not otherwise possible at the university, um, which has been, you know, it's, it's often hectic, but it seems always worthwhile. And we also, within that leadership team, have this sort of grants and special projects group. Um, we run a tutoring program on Friday evening at all of our youth correctional facilities that we work with. Um, where people across the university, even if you're not a faculty member, can go in and tutor students for about two and a half hours. Um, it's super popular and we team up with the PD Green, the, tut the undergraduate GED tutoring program. And we all carpool in together and we come back and we have a meal and a debrief. Um, and it's required if you're a faculty member, um, at least in the math and science, it's, you have to go in um, a certain number of times every semester to, to follow up with your students. Um, then we have the sort of operations and institutional liaising, um, which is where I fit in. Um, then sort of we also have uh, an administrative director and a part-time administrator. Um, we are able to pay th for a part-time administrator partially through funding from NJ Step. Um, they give us uh, money each semester to purchase our books um, and also to, for, to help pay for this part-time administrator, and then the Princeton office, uh, the dean of the college also gives us funding through the, the Center for Teacher Prep. Um, and our, our administrative director is, is the associate director of the center where we're located. So um, do, I have, do I have some time? A minute, OK. <laughs> um, I guess just very quickly, uh, the point I wanted to hit on here was um, our numbers and some of our just sort of where we're actually teaching out of. Um, our number one goal is basically this expanding of access to higher ed in New Jersey. This is at a recent um, graduation. Um, since 2006, we've served about 700 students. Um, again, we have about 75 to 100 uh, instructors per semester and we teach about 12 to 15 classes per semester. And we also teach throughout the summer, so that's another um, three to five courses. Um, and we're currently in six of the 13 state correctional facilities in New Jersey, and some of our faculty actually just started the first program in, um, in, a, in, a, in a, a federal prison um, in the state of New Jersey. So we're in all these, which are medium or medium maximum mixed facilities. And again, as Rob said, depending on sort of um, the type of facilities, the youth correctional facilities, because people are sort of coming in and out, you might have people released even during the class because it's shorter sentencing. Um, it's just very different course, courses. We end up, end up offering a lot more of our high level and our BA courses in the max securities where people just have much longer sentences. Uh, 40 of our students have gone on to enroll at Rutgers um, after their release. Um, and our facility, our, our, our faculty have participated in five associate's degree graduations. These are magical. Our last one was in August 2016 when we had 35 students at EJSP graduate. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to um, open the floor questions. I'm gonna invite our panelists to all come up with your handy dandy name tags. So I'm, the audience knows who you are by now, but just in case there's been some forgetfulness. So if everybody can just come up and um, take a seat here. Um, you know, I'll be on the side. Okay. I'll see. I'll see. I was there at the long line. <laughs> so I'll open the floor to um, for questions in just a second, but I just wanted to sort of launch the first one. And I wanted to pick up on a theme that both um, Jill and Rob that you talked about, and that is, could we just talk for a second, could you reflect on what you see as the impact that these kinds of programs have on the campuses of the universities that sponsor them in terms of undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty, and Jill, you had mentioned that it kind of brings people together in a way, but I wonder if you could just talk a little about that, about the model of how you um, both you and, and Rob um, yeah, I think we're pretty adamant about keeping um, keeping it to be sort of non-hierarchically arranged in terms of um, faculty, um, postdocs, and graduate students. 
And actually the most enthusiastic people about that sort of non-hire policy are the faculty. Um, they're all really enthusiastic to sort of uh, be collaborating with um, graduate students in this way, um, to be sort of co-designing a course um, which we don't do at all at Princeton, by the way. We don't, we don't actually get to lead any courses as graduate students and postdocs don't have any um, teaching possibilities either. So this is a really unique possibility for us to get sort of on-the-job pedagogy training um, that otherwise is, is, not, is not really possible at Princeton unless we you know, do some adjuncting at other universities. Um, and I, I guess the other thing is, I think it also stretches us in terms of um, we collaborate with some of the undergraduate um, groups, the, the SPEAR, I forget what it is, for prison, the student group for prison reform. We did a letter writing campaign with them called Project Solidarity last year where they were writing to people who were incarcerated um, and were in solitary confinement. Um, and we had you know, everybody throughout all of PTI really um, advertising that for an undergraduate student group, which um, which is, yeah, I think everybody feels good about that, <laughs> that it's not so segmented. Um, I could say a couple of things. Uh, well, so I've actually only been directing the Cornell program for a few years. I inherited this model where undergraduate service TAs. Um, I don't know, to teaching assistants, I don't know if what they assist with is always teaching. Um, but the prisons in New York really hamstring you in a lot of ways logistically as you run into the facility. And so a lot of times the undergraduates are involved in all kinds of things, handing out stuff, um, peeling aside with a uh, person who's maybe not up to speed with what's going on mathematically so that the rest of the group can move on, um, doing an extra form handed out by the CEOs as we walk in, arranging the carpools and other things. But we do use a lot of undergraduates in the Cornell program. Um, and it's synchronized with a curriculum on campus for an undergraduate minor. We launched this thing last year. We've got an undergraduate minor in prison studies. We've got 11 faculty members at Cornell that, whose research is tied to incarceration or criminal justice studies or something like the war on drugs, which relates. Um, and we had a lot of students who were um, TAing in our program, or we call it TAing, is really assisting with classes. Um, we're very hesitant to, I, I don't like the word TA, I think the undergrad, undergraduates don't teach undergraduates, so they're not teaching. Um, but they're assisting with the teaching, in a way. So um, that's become a requirement for a prison studies minor. And I know this is probably a, a pivotal issue for Brown, is what's your campus impact? Administrators will ask, what's your campus impact? Um, particularly on the tuition, <laughs> providing undergraduate students. Um, that's been a major piece that Engagement with the criminal justice system is considered a requirement of one of the minors at Cornell, and the Cornell Prison Education Program is one of the only ways you can fulfill that requirement. So we're necessary. Um, I also want to say that down the road, um, it's brought in family philanthropy to our program. Um, undergraduates who decided their graduate school career would be in a different path because they were engaged in undergraduate prison volunteering um, have a ripple effect into the narrative of their family's description of what their children do. Um, those parents become key allies of our program. Many of them are Cornell families, um, and some of them provided some of the initial <laughs> crucial gifts to getting us to the stage of being able to do things that required some resources that weren't just sitting there on campus. I mentioned two other quick things with graduate students. STEM graduate students, uh, particularly in the sciences, are oftentimes Research assistants who, who, if they are teaching assistants on campus at Cornell, they're, they're only limited to a section or so in terms of their teaching. They want to be able to run a course at least once on their own before they're done with graduate school. Um, and who gets an opportunity to teach biology 101 when you're in a plant science lab? Um, you're probably going to run a section once or twice, and the undergrads from Cornell are probably going to be like, well, great, this is the section. You know, it's not exactly the main meat of the course. Um, so it's a very enriching opportunity for the graduate students um, in STEM fields and greatly enhances their ability to place after they're done with their PhD. Finally, the law students, so we have a law school, um, teach a teaching practicum and it counts towards their JD. It's only L3 students. Um, this has also led to new forms of philanthropy towards our program. Um, and the other part of this is there's this ripple effect down the road of where our students end up retroactively starting college and prison programs where they go down the road and 
what you've called the higher education and prison movement continues to spread? Uh, <clears throat> so I have two questions. One for Mr. Orlick. I'm wondering about uh, educational leave. Do you use that at all in the state of Rhode Island? I know it's something that would be enormously powerful. We, we don't use it in New York, and we've been pushing for it, and it would be enormously powerful to think about individuals being able to leave prison and sit, come and actually sit in the ground in the classroom um, and be present. And then my other question is for Rob and Jill about the, uh, that I think also is, is pretty relevant here. Um, how do you negotiate the dynamics of running a program where the credits don't come from the Ivy League institution but rather come from the community college, uh, both in the context of explaining that to the world and also to the students who are in it? Well, I'll attempt to answer your question first. At this time, we do not have anyone on educational leave going to college because the college comes to the prison. Historically, we did have a handful of students go to campus on CCRI. We ran into a problem with one young man meeting his girlfriend at CCRI, which wasn't looked upon highly by the work release coordinator. So at this time, we don't have any active people leaving the campus. Um, we do, however, when we've just started, I mentioned the Pivot the Hustle program, that's the Work Release Career Readiness Program. We are just initiating a process for them to go to campus to Roger Williams University in downtown Providence. Um, that's it, it, in its infancy, so as circumstances arise where we could but conceivably, without compromising security, entertain that particular um, notion, I'd be visit it, but at this time, I just shared the status of that scenario with you. So, um, with well, yeah, good question about the uh, proxy credit from the community college. We um, Cornell also offers credit in our program, so and that's actually how we started. The community college, this is kind of the opposite of the Pell Grant days. So the community college was the bread and butter of the Pell Grant era, and a, sometimes four-year degree colleges would join in. In this era, you see a lot of four-year degree uh, granting colleges bringing in community colleges or finding a way to partner with them in order to confer degrees. Um, in the Ivy League, it is probably gonna be pretty tough to figure out how to convince um, boards of trustees that the education offered on one of these campuses can be replicated inside of a prison like Auburn Penitentiary. Um, what we're likely going to be doing, since we already figured out a mechanism to offer Cornell credit, but not Cornell degrees, so we have non-matriculate Cornell students, um, and very similar to what others have said uh, and probably will continue to say, um, is we'll probably have a one-year certificate program, big C, as I said, the little C one before, um, in the conversation with the deans about that right now, uh, an associate degree granted by the community college, which is largely where they come from in this country. Um, and we are getting close to having the four-year degree option as well through another proxy school um, where the Cornell may provide sort of an honors program within the context of that. Um, I actually see that as our probably final state with this. We'll probably be a certificate at the beginning, a kind of honors function along the way, and potentially looking at what is possible in the master's world later. So it's um, uh, finding that that's exactly the question for this whole conference, right? Is what's the special role for an Ivy League school within a context where, mo where you've got 1% with AAs and otherwise, you know, HSED is about 1,500 people from what I heard. Um, yeah, I think it's a great question and it's, it's one that I think if our program maybe had one goal, like it would be that, that if we would eventually have Princeton um, credit bearing courses. Um, and, it's, and it's often, you know, it's, it's, it's not fun to have that conversation with the students. Yeah, our university will not put its name on the courses that we're teaching here. Um, I think we have a, a hurdle that, uh, that separates us, unfortunately, from Cornell, because Rob and I were talking this morning about the fact that there's this, um, uh, a program that offers the continuing education. And so you can take a one credit bearing course and matriculate at Cornell without going through this admissions process. We don't have that at Princeton. It's literally you're enrolled for the degree or you're, you, don't, you can't take a Princeton course. There's no continuing ed, there's no extension school. Um, yeah, that would be my answer.
I guess my question is, um, what's the average length of stay uh, somebody who's in your pro incarceration? That's for somebody that's in your program. How many uh, courses do you offer? How many courses can they take a semester? And how many of them actually are able to complete with a bachelor's degree um, before they release? Like, would they have to be doing like eight or ten years? I, I'm just curious. Um, yeah, so I, I, I was kind of sh su not surprised but shocked by the 2,500 people in prison in Rhode Island. That's two of the facilities of the three we work in. Um, so let's see if I can get all your questions in there. Um, so we work with um, 150 students are getting credit-bearing courses right now. We've got 75 that we're helping get to the stage of being ready to take our courses. Um, we in tend to have people be successful. So by the time they're in a college credit bearing course, um, we want to be able to say that we have every confidence that they are going to succeed and complete their degree all the way in the same way someone would on any campus that's equivalent. Um, it takes about three and a half years for the average student in our program to complete all the requirements for an associate's degree. Um, and we've got a model for a bachelor's degree completion program that would take about six years. I've seen some ambitious folks do it in three, starting with zero credits. Many people have pre-existing college credits, and so that'll also accelerate if transfer courses are accepted, which is contingent upon college approval. And how many courses are you running a, a semester? Um, we had 11 courses between the three correctional facilities this summer, and I think we're offering 25 this fall. Um. So to start with that question, we're offering, we offer usually 13, 12 to 15 courses a semester and then an additional three to five in the summers. Um, I can't really, I don't know how to answer the bachelor's degree question yet, unfortunately. I know that, because um, it's just starting up this, this fall, but I, I would suspect that it would be about as long as it take, you know, in addition, um, it, about as long as it took them to do the associate's degree, it'll be about as long it will take them to, to complete the bachelor's. So if I think it was, it's between three and four years to complete the average associate's degree, so another three to four years for the, to get the bachelor's. So I have a, oh, microphone, can, can I use the mic and then pass it back along? Um, a question about how you um, inspire, convince, and then prepare your faculty and graduate students to do this work. So um, clearly sort of getting the word out and, and actually creating interest is, is one piece, but at the other end of the spectru spectrum of preparation, it's really not a good idea to just walk into a classroom and think that you can teach without understanding some, something about classroom methodologies and pedagogy and such. Um, and I would imagine that there are fictions that people hold in their heads about what these classrooms would might be like. Um, so how do you address all of those issues? Some of these questions are worth a conference in and of themselves. So very good question. Um, wow. Uh, well, one, for recruitment, I am not recruiting because I have too long of a list of people waiting. And the, but that's an inertia or momentum of 15 years of Cornell working on this. And the word of mouth, particularly amongst the graduate students, that this is a time. So we allow graduate students to propose courses, usually at the 100 or 200 level, work it through our education policy committee and get it rostered within the course catalog and offer it. And then we rotate out into a different curriculum semester by, so we'll, we'll knock out an English requirement, and then let someone else propose a different course to, to do that. And so that is the enthusiator, and I don't have to I don't have to walk around telling people, by the way, it's great to teach in prison. People are already excited by that. Added to it, the attraction of a timely political issue, which is that people are upset about how many people are in prison. Um, and the goal is not necessarily scale. I want to say that with some of these answers. Like, having um, a larger program isn't necessarily better. Um, it's, I, I've come to start telling people when, um, if you want a larger proportion of what's happening in college to be, uh, what's happening in prison to be college, another way to go is to shrink the size of the system. Um, but so to the final question you're asking, we actually are thinking of this in many ways with that component that's graduate student taught as teacher development. 
um, and I've got a director that's actually just mainly focused on observing them during their first weeks of running a course in prison um, and making sure that the basic literacies that are necessary to get what is going on in a Cornell classroom are there because a lot of people will come with the assumptions of campus and it's a different environment um, as a lot of things we've said. You drop a name, right, we name drop. You go to Wikipedia, someone's on Wikipedia before they're out of the room on their cell phone figuring out who it is. If you do that in prison, there's no way to check it unless that's been supplied with a library or a course reader or some other reference system. Um, so that, this, these are things that we are, um, there's a lot of administrative need for that. Um, in terms of generating enthusiasm, I'd say that we're slightly different. We don't have a wait list. Um, we have had to turn people away before, but normally, um, we're recruiting sort of course by course, and sometimes this is very easy and we do have too many people, but, um, but, but our issue is mostly that we don't get to pitch courses. We're not in the situation where we're really designing the, the curriculum. Um, and so we'll receive word of what courses we're being asked to teach, and we can certainly say we can't do that, or would it be okay to teach Italian instead of Latin, or you know, whatever. Um, but, but mostly, like this summer, we just got requests that were far too late. It was like a month before they, supposed to, they, they had to start teaching. And people are very hesitant for good reason to sign on at that point. Um, so we're sort of trying to work on having earlier curriculum um, committee meetings so that we can more effectively recruit. Because I think we have far more interest than we're actually able to take advantage of because of the timing of course planning. Um, the other thing, uh, so in terms of training, um, sort of, it starts with we have sort of hiring interviews. There's an interview process to, to get this, and then we have uh, drop-in hours where we meet one-on-one -on -one with each new faculty member and sort of work through all the logistics of the teaching. Then we have uh, day-long trainings for both for whatever field you're in. You have a, a training on the sort of pedagogical model of that field for PTI. And then you have a day-long <coughs> training with New Jersey STEP in conjunction with the Department of Corrections, which is half sort of, here's how to be safe, but it's also half um, meet the students. The Student Advisory Board runs a training um, for each new instructor or groups of instructors uh, about what they think makes a great instructor and what makes a terrible instructor. And it's very honest and uh, the most useful part of, I think, the training. And then I think we similarly see, particularly on sort of joint faculty and graduate student teams, this is a sort of like teaching mentorship opportunity. Um, but we have things like observations that are also scheduled by our accreditation partner. Uh, just speaking for CCRI uh, instructors at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, the cut and dried answer is that I go to the departments, be it natural science, humanities, English, math, and ask them for an instructor because I'm a college campus, in effect. I have 12 credit classes a semester on average, and they are responsible for assigning an instructor to me. Um, if it's listed in the banner system, which it is because I create the class and then they see what classes they have to provide instructors for. The less cut and dried answer is that I've gotten several departments tell me that uh, I, don't, I don't have anyone who wants to teach there. And what I did in that case was I found one myself. And I found a woman with a master's degree in oceanography. I got her approved as an adjunct by that department chair. Next thing you know, she was doing a bang up job in medium and maximum teaching oceanography and geology. And then he stole her away from me and put her on the Westerly campus. <laughs> sort of. Um, so what, actually what ends up happening is a lot of the enthusiasm generates itself once people found out that this program was there. And I have a lot of what I think might be called social activists teaching for me who are interested in this setting. And so they've come forward. And of course, I've mentioned that Brown has sent me some people. Providence College sent me some. She came on her own. She heard about it. Um, you know, they became adjunct faculty for CCRI for that semester and they taught. Um, as far as orientation, into what it's going to be like in the classroom, that, that is tough because when they first walk in, that's when they find out what it's like to be in the classroom. However, Department of Corrections has a four-hour um, orientation that all new volunteers, interns, and instructors go through to talk about what you should, shouldn't do, what you can expect, etc. 
And then I offer my own sort of informal orientation where we sit and talk at length, however long it takes for them to understand what's going to be happening. Take them on a tour if need be, or certainly go in the first couple of classes with them and orient them and, and, and do the whole attendance thing and so forth. So, and as I mentioned when I spoke before, most of the instructors are very excited about having done it. And uh, that word spreads around. So I'm at a point now where I can just call departments directly and say, can I have this person? This English instructor has been with me for eight years. He's doing a bang up job every time. And uh, sort of self-perpetuates self to an extent. Well, does that count as the part of the normal faculty load when they teach for you? Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. I think there are some questions on the side of the room. Did you want to lose sweat over there? Hi, how are you? Um, First of all, Rob and Joe, welcome to Rhode Island, and thank you for thank you for your valuable info. Um, uh, I don't know what percentage of the prisons uh, in your respective states are actually involved um, uh, or immersed in college college program. How many how many more you could reach out to? So that would be a question. And um, if there are other prison systems out there or even getting more colleges involved, it um, would be great if we can um, uh, take roads to promote your program. Um, I'm the president of the Correctional Education Association in the state of Rhode Island. Um, coincidentally, uh, last this, this past year at Lake, uh, Lake George, New York, we had a conference with uh, several hundred, uh, probably about four or five hundred, I believe was the count, of correctional educators. This year we're going to be in Cape May, New Jersey. So um, I go, oh, wow, Jill, you'll be a, it'll be an excellent, it'll be excellent for you to possibly speak, and maybe I can get your card, uh, and I can give you information about the upcoming conference. So that 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 will be um, helpful to the correctional educators in New Jersey to help spread the word and the good work that you're doing, and hopefully maybe outreach to other uh, prison systems who might not be uh, aware of your program or don't know uh, how to get involved, even in their own community. Maybe you got, this could be like a model for the state and encourage others, uh, prison systems uh, who haven't used the program to uh, step up to the plate. Um, my other question is in regards to, um, and I think it's great that we're having college programming that leading to degrees, but on the other note, um, we all have to be realists and college is not for everyone. We have a lot of people who are incarcerated who can learn a trade who are very good hands-on. And I know community colleges are uh, excellent in having vocational apprenticeship programs leading to some kind of a certification. Um, so that would be a question that I would have if maybe down the road, maybe both your programs might, if you think it's of value, but I, 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 would, I would, as a as someone who has a little experience in education and corrections, would feel that um, I think that might be something to look into maybe uh, apprenticeship uh, college pro programming which is leading towards an apprenticeship track, apprenticeship certification where once the students leave, they could actually continue with that apprenticeship program on the outside. So even if they didn't complete it yet, they're gonna have those X amount of hours in working under a journeyman um, to learn those, those skills. And another question I would have, and um, I was just looking at one of the cu curriculums that was posted up there, and I saw it had Arabic and Latin. Now, I, I am Syrian, part Syrian, so I do speak some Arabic. But I was asking myself, I was surprised like Spanish or, 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 or maybe Italian um, wasn't part of that curriculum. And, and this is a, a question that I have because sometimes you look at curriculums that they might offer, and I ask myself, you know, it's great they're having these programs, these classes, but um, the relevancy towards students' lives or the interest, and I was wondering if they ever decided to generate a survey to those students who are incarcerated with the list of different programs or classes which might be relevant to help them. So not only taking classes for classes sake, but I've taken many classes in my undergraduate degree uh, prior to getting my PhD and even in my PhD program um, where I asked myself in reflection, you know, how much did that class ever help me, you know, in regards to pursuing, you know, don't get me wrong, education in itself is good and it's always great and all types of education is great, but I was thinking if maybe we could somehow generate a student input sheet in regards to 
you know, you could have a, a, a some kind of barometer, you know, these are the types of programs, because we all know that when we are undergraduates, we're going to take these general education cl classes, and sometimes some are more relevant than others to help us succeed in life, such, a, such, such as financial literacy, et cetera. So thank you very much. <laughs> Those are big questions, and maybe we should not talk entirely about the entire value of liberal arts education. <laughs> well, some of the questions about the relevance of humanities education are the same ones that we have on the outside world, too. So um, that is familiar terrain. Um, I, I guess I'll say uh, that you have a couple of questions there. So the thing about working with multiple other colleges, um, I'm definitely a coalition guy. Um, New York's got a bunch of programs. I wish there were more in our area. If we had a will at the community college we worked at, we'd be better off. Um, that would just allow Cornell to do more of Cornell's thing. And so to your vocational question, I guess I'll say, I don't know if Cornell would do a great job of vocational and apprenticeship type education. Um, the community college might do a better job in our uh, neck of the woods, but I, I don't know. Um, and around, I don't know, it's, it's all about what uh, departmental and other configuration, we've got a hotel school. Everyone always is trying to get us to make <laughs> hotel managers in prison, I don't know. We also are working in uh, maximum security prisons, which people are in there long term. Um, if you're in a releasing facility, you're gonna have a different dynamic going on there too. So this is a very site-specific medium college in prison. Um, I just wanna say one other thing here too, which is uh, on the coalitional um, and kind of questions around social activists always wanting to jump in. The training, someone had a question over here about how do you um, prepare folks, has become one of the main things I think we deliver. We make that into a huge pr and kind of wonderful production. Um, I almost think of code switching as a trained activism that we're offering in a way, because they go through what is actually, to be honest, a very boring training and security protocol through the prison, and then we bring them to Cornell campus, um, and we put on a big production of sort of translating back into the narrative of education um, why it is we're going to comply with these rules in the interest of advancing this project. Um, and a lot of this comes from people, the, the motivations of the teacher are part of a class. So I have n number of people that want to come in and say, there's no way for me to do an introductory English class without talking about the Black Panthers. And I have to push back the syllabus and say, you know what, remember the protocols of the prison and what kind of things this excites within there. Um, and we actually get into a really lively conversation about what are the actual resistances to institutional problems that we're trying to pursue through the offering of a liberal arts education in prison, and which ones might have some other forum. Um, but that's, that's the terrain politically and kind of conceptually that most people come to this work from our campuses. Um, and the practical question, again, it, you know, our undergraduates at, at Cornell face the same questions, and they're not always answered easily. Um, I'll touch on a couple of the questions too. Um, we're in seven of the 13 facilities, state facilities in New Jersey. Um, that's what STEP is in, actually. We're, we've only taught in six of those seven. Um, some of them just don't have uh, educational facilities set up or, um, yeah, there are sort of logistical problems with setting up uh, programming in some of those other, um, other facilities where there's no higher ed currently. Um, in terms of voc tech, it, it's facility by facility. I know that the, it's not an either or thing necessarily. I've had students who are doing like a carpentry certificate while they're also taking classes. They'll have sort of an inside job and they'll be doing, um, you know, work on becoming a certified electrician. But at the same time, they're in my, you know, world literature survey in the evenings. Um, and I, I, I think that we could do a better job coordinating with those types of programs. It's mostly that we just ask the students to tell us about their lives, what they're doing outside of our course, so that we can better understand their, their time um, and resources for, for getting um, work done outside of the classroom. Um, in terms of Latin and Arabic, both of those were actually student petitioned courses. <laughs> so um, we had a group of classicists who were teaching a lot of composition courses, and they just started talking about how excited they were about their subject. And the students were like, wait a second, you're so excited about this, why are you not teaching this? Um, and so we had to bring this like list of students, like 10 students who really were dying to take Latin, and now um, those students will become the tutors for the next generation of um, Inside Latin students. And um, Albert C. Wagner 
and they're public there's some an article that was published in like a like a tiny Latin like highly academic journal that came out of that class. Um, and then Arabic, we have a lot of students who were really interested in Quranic study at one of our um, at, at, at EJSP at East Jersey, and so that's where that one came from. Um, so often we're responding to student need, but it's a back and forth. They see who we are, what we're teaching at Princeton, and they want access to those same courses. Uh, thanks, everyone. This is a question, uh, I guess, going off the uh, subtitle of the conference, does Brown have a role? So it's just about what Brown is doing right now. Um, Amy, you're teaching a course uh, that uh, in medieval history, and I was just wondering, are these the courses that brown people are teaching, or is that a separate uh, program? If you could talk about how brown faculty are teaching uh, relevant to the, the CCRI. Uh, so I'm actually, I'm not teaching medieval history this semester. What I'm teaching is Locked Up, A Global History of Prison and Captivity, which is a course I'm teaching both at Brown and at the ACI. And then Will can talk about the Brown faculty and the CCRI courses. Yeah, these are all CCRI classes with CCRI instructors who came from different places in some cases. Uh, Can I, can I say who's, it's okay to say, yeah, right? Uh, Sabine Moritz from Brown is teaching human anatomy. She's the one who wanted to bring a cow's heart in. <laughs> and uh, intro theater uh, is being taught by a community activist who's head of, I forget what it's called, but he came through, well, he came through me. He called me, he wrote me. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Humans in the Environment is Allison, um, who came from Brown. Matt, did you get me, Allison? No, Don was thinking about it, but we found Right, okay, so, and then, you know. But is um, Megan? Megan Coleman is actually a known person to a lot of you because she's, she's a postdoc at Brown and a very involved community activist. and an incredible instructor who teaches the general sociology in maximum that you're looking at. Um, and then, you know, in previous semesters, uh, I, for, I forget that there were a number of people that passed through who, as I was saying before, came from Brown or from Providence College or from the outside and just knew about the program, wanted to see what it, what it took to, uh, to teach. Actually, I have a, a, a funny little anecdote about Matt Garza who teaches theater. He was doing his HR forms for CCRI in my office and he's filling them all out and he said, I didn't know I was getting paid for this, Will. <laughs> yes, you are. A measly adjunct salary. 